Hello and welcome to My Security TV in our Tech and Sec Weekly. My name's Chris Coverage. I'm the editor with My Security Media. Today we're joined by Nigel Fair, Professor Practice, Department of Software Systems and Cybersecurity with Monash University. Nigel, good to see you again. Good, Chris. Yeah, good to be with you. Uh, the Australian Cyber Security Strategy 2023 to 2030, although I was thinking they might as well wait until January and just make it 2024. Uh, they've almost got an extra year out of this. Uh, a seven-year strategy, three horizons have been established uh, within the next seven years. Uh, and it's, uh, it's the strategy is bold and ambitious, uh, according to Claire O'Neill, the Minister for Home Affairs and Cybersecurity. Your initial take on the strategy, and then we'll kind of just dissect it a little bit and uh, and give it some critique. Yeah, thanks. My initial take is I actually think it's quite a well-written strategy. But you, you raise a really good point about the, let's call it the seven-year horizon. You know, you think back three or four years ago where we were with technology, it'd be a brave person to predict where we're going to be with technology you know, in the next three to four years, let alone the next seven the way that criminals um, adapt to the online environment uh, is going to be really interesting. So it's, it's, it's got the, the, the gateways through it, but it's going to be interesting how it stands the test of time. My, my thoughts on strategy is there's always you've got to implement it, right, the implementation plan. So there is an action plan that's been released. I haven't seen any sort of new funding. There's not a lot uh, of new money. And my other thought was let's go back to the last strategy and where are we? That was a 2020 strategy with Peter Dutton, uh, a $1.6 billion funding over the next 10 years. So that was almost a 10-year uh, approach. But then since then, we've had our largest breaches uh, and uh, the situation's getting worse. So Claire O'Neill's sort of bold uh, strategy or bold vision to be the most secure country in the world by 2030 uh, it's far enough away from an existing government. I can't be. I can't help but be a sceptic uh, in this. I might just be getting older. Um, where, where do you see the strengths, maybe, and then we'll, we might come back to the weaknesses. But what, what's really strong uh, about this strategy that you that sort of stands out to you? I think that the things that stand out, going back to the data breaches that you just mentioned, and how it really hits, um, you know, individual, small to medium business, is is the is the first part of the strategy, and that's strong business and citizens. Now, you are, I think, you are right to to be, pick up on the where's the work plan, where, what does good look like? So it's great to say that we're going to be the most cyber secure country. I actually don't think we need to be the most cyber secure country. We just need to be a whole lot more. It's the wildebeest. Um, Example: We just need to be more more secure and, and more robust and more resilient than, than a lot of our um, G20 neighbours, so that the criminals go after them, not after us. So I do like the idea with the latest data breaches, um, what that's going to mean. But there's a huge amount of work um, in and around that. There's a huge amount of legislative work, for example, about what data is being collected by these organisations, why are they keeping it, who has access to it, when does it get deleted let alone before we actually we get into the doing. So I, I think if we start with that as their number one, I, I kind of like that. As we go through the, the rest of the uh, the, the documents um, and the, the shields, as they call them, um, they're, they're important, but we have to do those anyway. Yeah, protecting critical infrastructure. We've already got quite a detailed um, SOCI legislative act we've got the cyber and critical infrastructure center we, we, we've already got some quite good things that are happening along already there um yeah the first the first couple of years is about strengthening and our foundations which is pretty much doing what we are now and checking where we are so i, I read that with a uh, again a, a mind a mindset of it's going to be much the same uh, until uh, the, the next couple of years then expand our reach and then lead the frontier, which is uh, sort of having a vision, which is which is fine from a strategic viewpoint. Um, I suppose another one here is when we look at the Soki Act and critical infrastructure, the telcos managed to stay out of that uh, initially, uh, but we've had head of telcos on, in leading the industry growth, uh, industry programs within this as well. So again, I wonder how much inside knowledge that they've had uh, in relation to these strategies and cybersecurity is not critical infrastructure and it's still not sort of confirmed that that's actually going to happen uh, within this plan. What's your thoughts there given uh, the recent Optus outage 
and the significant impact nationally that that had? Well, I think, well, apart from tying straight into you know, protecting individuals and, and businesses, I, th I think the issue we have with critical infrastructure protection is you have such wide variances of maturity um, across the board. So banking and finance sector, you know, our, our big banks, they spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year in cyber security and, and an all hazards approach. You know, they get risk. Some of the other um, sectors, you know, higher education, where I spend a large chunk of my time, th th there's some levels of maturity in some parts but you know for example you, you you've got academics that want to be able to do whatever they want however they want if ever they want for example and, and that's been their shtick you know all, all through their career so I, I i think it's a left and right of arc which is our, our issue with critical infrastructure protection here from the last strategy there was funding for the, the tertiary sector to uplift did you see any of that i think there was around four million dollars allocated did you see that come through no I, I don't know where it where it came through whether it went to individual um, institutions or not but, but, but let's be frank four million dollars is you know is, yep. is, is, is not much in the scheme of things you don't, you don't get much bang for that buck nice well i suppose that's that's a key point is uh when i do a, a sort of a search for fund or funding uh, in this, uh, there's not a lot there. Uh, the other takeaway that I had is an executive cyber council. Um, again, just a, another voice for, I would imagine, big business. How I don't know where small business will be represented. Maybe the small business um, enterprises or sort of associations might get a seat, but then that, that how that actually trickles down to 90% of the economy, which is small business. Mm. How do you see that sort of, from a, an action plan, did you see much there for small business? How are they actually going to roll that out for small business other than sort of Microsoft-led programs? Well, well, I think that's what it's going to be. Yeah, you've got the current Cyber Wardens program, which what, is that funded for about $24 million. I don't know what they've delivered with that. But you, you, you're right, at, at the launch um, with the Minister and the Prime Minister, you you had CEOs of some, some very big organisations, you know, banks, you know, airlines, etc. I'm, I'm going to guess and say probably the CEO of Cosbo was there. Uh, but but, it, but it's, that's where all the vulnerabilities are with the small and medium businesses for a number of reasons. One, they collect an awful lot of data about us for their day-to-day -day, um, um, work, but also they're parts of really big supply chains. And so you could be a, a supermarket at one of the big chains and have everything sorted, but one of your suppliers might not have everything sorted in the online environment. So uh, that's where we've really got to uplift small business. You know, as you said, it's 90 plus percent of businesses and, and probably the same when it comes to work, the workforce. The other one was government themselves uh, and that requirement. The auditors reports uh, for federal government continue to highlight that even the federal government uh, is not meeting their maturity models uh, sufficiently. Uh, again, rolling that out between federal government, state government and local government, uh, there's a lot there to do? Well, there, there is. You know, federal government have been mandated but since July 22 to um, abide by the essential aid from the Australian Signals Directorate. And if you look at you know, the ANAO reports, yeah, most of them are just nowhere near it. And that's even when they went to a maturity rating model. So, um, you yeah, know, whether they tinker around with that to make it either easier or, or more uh, achievable, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but like everything, you know, it just costs money and businesses, whether it's government or, or, or otherwise, you know, they get all these productivity benefits and savings out of being online with a lot more to come. You know, when you look at the AI revolution that's, that's in front of us, when you look at a post-quantum world that's in front of us, that has to be the investment into um, risk management. I suppose the other one, reflecting back, so Home Affairs will be the lead agency on a majority of this, and I can't help but think, sort of go back to the initial strategies with, say, Malcolm Turnbull and sort of the new era of the cybersecurity mm -hmm. strategy. We've we've always kind of had one, but initially the, it was the creation of the Australian Cybersecurity Centre, then we brought the ASD sort of alongside then ASD became the lead. Now it's back over to Home Affairs. Um, do you think there's enough consistency here? Do you think that may be part of the problem in terms of either a lack of leadership or lack of consistency within the government structure itself? Well, and on top of that, you've got the um, cyber coordinator 
in, in, in home affairs. So you've, you've got a lot of chess pieces here. I'm sure they're all, they get on well and they're all smart people and it'll all be joined up. I have a degree of confidence there. What I'd like to sort of see more is leveraging resources. We only saw last week, for example, the signals director come out with their yearly threat report and, and that just, you know, got not much attention at all, you know, and there's a lot of really rich information that businesses can use there. And they're the sorts of things that we should be amplifying. And, and they're, they're kind of easy wins amongst businesses saying, you know, they stipulate this is where the threats are coming from. You know, it's still ransomware, it's still really big business. Email compromise is really big. These are the tools and techniques that we're seeing by the threat actors. You know, to, to me, that's a classic baseline that you could use rather than just putting out another awareness course or building another website. I agree. And I'm just doing a, a, just on where that is in the strategy. Did you see much reference to that threat report? Because I think an annual threat report uh, is a little bit late. It's a little bit uh, sort of in the rear view mu- uh, mirror. Yeah. It's almost we almost need a national monthly cybersecurity report to really get that up to date. Because again, uh, those things like the recent Optus outage, the DP world, uh, shut down are not in the current threat report, and so they they get missed. Uh, I, I would like to see almost a, a monthly threat report, given how fast things are moving. I think that's a good idea, and I think it needs to be written for various audiences. You need, you know, a, a tech one that actually talks about, you know, who the threat actors are, and and, and you know, you need to patch your Citrix system, for example, which DP yeah. probably should have done. Um, we we need that for the technical people. We need a policy one for the, the, the risk managers and, and everything in those sorts of organisations so they can put that into their spreadsheets. And, and you know, we, I know it's in the strategy, but we need to do a lot more work into these lessons learned. You know, crisis comms is, is probably one of the big things that we're learning coming out of this. Well, I will give it to the ACSC and ASD in terms of those, the advisories that they do come out with, but given mm-hmm. the amount of vulnerabilities, right, these are critical systems. That you mentioned Citrix, uh We've had some Cisco ones. You, know, you just look at the cyber cyber.gov.au advisories over the last month or so, mm-hmm. and they're all critical, urgent uh, advisories on critical systems. And uh, really, that's a that's a red flag in my mind when we think of how vulnerable these systems are. And then think about the size of these companies and, and infrastructure they have. They can't just patch these up uh, overnight. It's uh, you know otherwise we do get potential outages like Optus. Is that where part of that real challenge is, the amount of vulnerabilities in these critical systems that are existing and yet to even be found uh, and then uncovered? Well, I think it goes back and, and before that. So, so yes, and the strategy does talk about you know, what we call colloquially called secure code, making sure you know, the, the, the apps that are being built, the, um, you know, the, the front-end application stuff is, is built you know, securely. And, and, and there's lots of information out there. You know, you've got OWASP out there, which will give you a whole lot of guidance about, you know, with their top 10, for example. So it's not like this doesn't exist. But I think it comes back to the investment. And, you know, it's one thing getting those advisories. If you're a small to medium organisation, even at the large to medium size, you probably don't have a very mature technology capability, you're probably relying a lot on vendors and outsource. If you don't have a test environment, to, uh, to trial these patches before you put it into production, then, uh, yeah, yeah my, my fear is people just go into chicken little mode and, and don't do anything or just, you know, we, we, we've also got to get the words right, Chris. We've also got to, you know, we hear still too much of, you know, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. We still hear too much about people are our weakest link. We, we, I think we need to probably put a bit more of a positive spin about this is actually achievable. These are the steps you go through to make it achievable. Yeah, I think um, one other idea in, in that reporting, I'm not seeing anything in here in the action plan in terms of how the government will report, but those advisories need to be a little bit more granular. You you know, they, otherwise they're, they're that often that you do kind of switch off to them yeah. uh, critical. If, you, if you're seeing a system, you know, let, let's say Cisco and you don't use Cisco, then you kind of switch off to them. I think there's a bit of a danger and I think maybe that's something that business, any business can say, look, this is our our architecture, these are the systems that we actually operate with. You tell us when any of these are being reported or you're seeing things early that uh, suggest that there's a vulnerability or attack vector there through those systems. And that way, I think the government and, and the ACSCs can talk at a granular level back to the market uh, and provide that, you know, even within this strategy, there's a, a challenge to create a single 
portal for reporting cybersecurity and how many yeah. agencies are actually involved. I think that's part of the problem uh, with language, as you say, and communication uh, platforms as well. Yeah, I, I don't think report cyber has been great. It's, it's, you know, from feedback I get, it's difficult, particularly if you don't know what's happened. If you're, a, again, a small and medium business and, and you can't log in in the morning, you don't know whether it was ransomware and yeah. you get the demand or business. Do we, all, are we, do we all report that? Do we all report, you know, yeah. you get 11 million reports, uh, my system was down, or how often we get hit by, say, a business email compromise. Yeah. Do we report that to, to cyber.gov or is that a scam watch? Uh, I think these are the, the questions that need to be raised. What is your thought? Do we need a single portal for everything? Is it possible? Well, I think we, need, we definitely need a single portal. The scam thing is really interesting. So we've gone from you know, 2.1 billion last year to 3.1 billion in reported losses. You know, remember, that's only reported losses. Um, you, you've got the ACCC as a coordinating body, but they're not a doing body. You know, they just coordinate. So I, I don't see the point of that. You've got the National Anti-Scam Centre, which maybe they're still standing themselves up, but I'm yet to see any brilliance apart from a website come out of that. And and, and that's where they really should be looking at the technical things. Um, to, to how do you put the sand in the gear of these cyber criminals? I suppose one last one is the structure. State government as well often have their own cyber security strategy one thing I find with these national strategies is, one, they're not attached to other strategies, how this aligns with other key strategies and then how it aligns at a national level to our state governments and there's often a disconnect where everyone's off doing their own thing. Do you see how this meshes with other strategies and state government, for example? Yeah, I, I'm not across all the state government ones. I know Queensland had a discussion paper out earlier this year for their cyber strategy. I've not seen it being released. Maybe they might flip that around and wait till now the Commonwealth one is out and adjust there so it dovetails in. That would be probably the order of events. But of course, you've also got local government too, which is, you know, has a lot of technology, holds a lot of personal data. Um, and, you know, again, very low maturity levels on the whole. You would wonder, uh, and I don't know the answer, but is local government within our critical infrastructure framework. I don't think they are, uh, but that might be something that uh, is considered given the amount of services that they provide. Do you know the answer to that? Just I, out of I, I don't think they are. I think that there's 11. There's 11. Uh, there's 11, correct. Yeah, and I, I don't think they're part of it. No, I haven't seen. Uh, and then if the telcos aren't in there either, I think these are the type of gaps that we're thinking about uh, just in our short conversation. And uh, look, the idea today, Nigel, was one, to get your expert opinion on this, and uh, we do appreciate from the industry's perspective your, your contribution. You're always out there with, uh, with wise commentary, I would say, uh, and so uh, I do take your opinion that quite uh, high valued, uh, and given the strategy, the purpose here is to get people to read this strategy, read the action plan, and be aware of what's actually happening, uh, but also to provide some critique, because as I get older... These strategies, I see them again and again, and uh, I wonder what they actually do deliver other than some political rhetoric. Uh, that's my, my current take on it at the moment. But Nigel Fair, Professor, Practice, Department of Software Systems and Cybersecurity with Monash University. Any call to action for you, Nigel? What, what have you got planned for 2024 that you wanted to highlight before we go? Um, I'm, what I'm interested in is the evolution of threat intelligence and how that can actually provide, you know, hence the word intelligence, provide meaningful metrics and actionable data for people to use, again, at technical and non-technical levels. Yeah, we've seen a proliferation of, of products and services out there by vendors and consultancies and that sort of stuff. I'd like to sort of see how that matures to a usable product. Nice. Threat intelligence is a big, that's like drinking the ocean. You've got to be very particular uh, yeah. in terms of what you do there as well. But Nigel Fair, thank you so much. Uh, all the best for the end of the year and the festive season. And hopefully we'll catch up again in 2024. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Great to chat.